Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's great to see you all, and uh, thanks for joining us online as well. My name is Steve. I'm part of the team here at uh, Foundry Community Church, and we've just been asking a question there, which is, what is your least favorite part of Christmas? So let's hear it. Where was that? Sorry, Sprouts? Taking down the decorations. That's a great answer. Any other answers? When it's finished, here's something over here then. No? Caroline's cooking. Is it really bad? Phil, is it bad? He's not saying anything. Any other answers? Writing out all the cards, yeah, absolutely. Especially hard when you have so many friends, isn't it? That's not me, I mean, but anyway. Um, so for me, a few things, least favorite things about Christmas. Um, number one on my list is sprouts. <clears throat> I'm with you, Liam. Um, and I can feel that there's kind of mixed emotions in the room. I can see some of you looking at me quite angry and some of you looking at me um, like you agree. We've not actually had like a traditional uh, Christmas dinner for, for like six years in our home now. We, um, I think this is probably something of my childhood coming out, but at growing up, we weren't allowed to leave the, the table on Christmas Day to go and open presents until um, all the veg was done on the plate. And as a, an anti-veg man, um, that meant I was there for some time. And so uh, I just felt a few years ago to say to the girls, look, um, what would you love for Christmas dinner? Because I think Christmas should be, um, I think it should be fun, right? And so they said chicken nuggets. And so we, they had chicken nuggets. We had, I think we had um, chicken wings. Like, that's a great Christmas day for me. Um, the other th another thing for me is Christmas shopping. Sorry, I don't know what's going on, but it, I, it feels really loud, Gordon. I feel like I'm echoing. Am I not? It must be up here somewhere. Um, okay, um, so something else uh, for me would be um, Christmas shopping. Christmas shopping. Anybody else hate Christmas shopping? A few of us. Um, I just can't stand Christmas shopping. So much so, and I've told this story before. That's loads better. Thank you, Gordon. Um, I've told this story before, but um, a few years back, um, I just decided not to do any Christmas shopping. And instead, I empowered my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law to do it for me um, when it came to buying Ruth a present. How bad is that? It's really shocking, isn't it? It's really bad. And anyway, it came to Christmas Day, and presents were being given out, and I was given this gift. And I thought, this is good size, this. This looks like it's going to be a good one. I open it up, and inside this present was a maroon handbag. And you know when you have to do that thing where you kind of smile and, like, thank you for the gift, Mandy? Um, anyway, she then pointed out to me, no, that's not for you. That was for you to give to Ruth. So um, ever since then, I've done my own Christmas shopping, but it's all online these days. Um, and then the last thing for me, really, is just the general chaos of Christmas. It can be a really chaotic time can't it? There's a song, um, which you may have guessed what the song is based on the title for the message today, called The Most Wonderful Time of the Year, or It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year, song by Andy Williams. Anybody remember the original by Andy Williams? 1963. It actually um, has only ever peaked at number 21 in the UK singles charts, and that was actually in 2007, so like 44 years later. But it's since been sung by people like Johnny Mathis. Have I said that name right? Yeah. Um, Amy Grant, Peebo Bryson, Garth Brooks, not to be confused with Crooks, Harry Connick Jr., Barlow Girl, Kylie Minogue, Steve Mackey, and J-Lo. A very well-known song for the season. It's a holiday classic all about kids jingling bells, getting together with friends and family, parties, toasting marshmallows, caroling in the snow, telling ghost stories, that wonderful Christmas tradition, uh, mistletoe, hearts will be glowing. The most wonderful time of the year. Notice, though, there's no mention of sprouts. <laughs> and there's no mention of Christmas shopping. But there's also no mention um, of numerous things that for many actually make Christmas the most difficult time of the year. There's the general chaos, which I just mentioned. There's the relational struggles. There's the family feuds that always come up at Christmas time because that's when you see 
those family members. There's the, 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 the broken marriage. There's the financial pressures, which so many will be feeling in society right now. There's the mental exhaustion that comes around this time of year. There's the grief. There's the, the refugee crisis that's on our doorstep at the moment. There's the conflict in Ukraine and so many other things that are difficult about this time of year, which, um, like, no, I don't mean this in any disrespect to Andy Williams. He couldn't mention some of those things because they weren't happening at the time. But maybe, just maybe, there's actually a gap in the market. Anybody ever dreamed of having a Christmas number one? There must be somebody that's dreamed of having a Christmas number one. Oh, there we go. Well, here's my suggestion for a song title that I think would be a hit. It's the most wonderfully difficult, chaotic, painful, hurtful time of the year. I could see that one on Top of the Pop. Does Top of the Pop still happen? Probably not. Um, but this truth that Christmas is both hopeful and painful is something that is made clear to us in the Nativity story. The Christmas story is actually anything but calm and wonderful for the people of the little town of Bethlehem. And we're going to read this story together. It's going to come up on the screen so that you can follow along. It's in Matthew chapter 2. And uh, I'll, I'll just pause a few times throughout just to um, look at a few parts with us. But let's read this together. Matthew chapter 2 says this, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Just pause there for a moment. We're introduced here to the person who we're going to look at a lot today, which is King Herod. And what happens here is that his authority gets questioned. Wise men enter into his palace, and they say to him, hey, where is the king? Herod, of course, would have been forgiven for saying he's here, but they said, where is this newborn king? It would be a little bit like you or I walking into Buckingham Palace at the moment and saying to Charles, where's the king that's been born? Where is this king that we're looking for? Then in verse 3, it says, King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. What we see here is King Herod, he's feeling threatened. There's this direct threat that's come to him over his rule over Judea. The thing you need to know about Herod is he has something of a dark past. A dark past of jealousy when he feels threatened. Herod has ten wives. Imagine that. He has numerous princes from his men. There's nothing wrong with having a wife, by the way. I just need to clarify that. But ten might be too many, right? Um, but because of that, he has numerous princes, numerous sons. And because of that, there were numerous plots and schemes to overturn and overthrow him as the king from his own sons. It would be an understatement then to say that family life was messy. There were attempted poisonings and sibling rivalries. And here's what we know about Herod. Herod murdered three of his sons for suspicion on suspicion of treason. He murdered his favorite wife of the ten, as well as one of his mother-in-laws. He also had a high... Sorry, my mother-in-law sat right there. I'm making no jokes at this point. That was a terrible thing to do. Um, he also had the high priest drowned during a game of water polo. He also murdered several of his uncles and his cousins. Caesar Augustus, who was the Roman emperor of the day, said better to be Herod's uh, pig than his sons. And I'm filling you in on all of this history because it's helpful for us to see that this is the kind of man that Herod is. Herod would do everything he could to keep his position of power. That was his reputation. And then we're going to jump forward, and what we see is that Herod investigates into the prophecies that um, he's heard about this king of the Jews coming and being born. And then we find out that his track record continues. It says this in verse 7. Then Herod sent a private message, so this is the beginning of social media, to the wise men asking them to come see him. 
At this, at this meeting, he learned the exact time when they first saw the star. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. We talked about this earlier in the year, but a great reminder for us here that Jesus was a refugee. And we as a society would do well and the church would do well to remember that. And then it says this, stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. This is a desperately uh, dark and distressing part of the Christmas story. I don't know about you, but I've never seen this in the school nativity plays that I've had the joy of sitting through. Uh, You don't really see about this, and we don't sing about this in our Christmas carols. It's not something that's particularly preached about in the Advent series. So I thought, why not do it today and cheer us all up? But this is like a desperately dark part of the Christmas story. Maybe it's something that we'd all be tempted at times when we're reading the Christmas story to kind of skip past, to to avoid it. Because what we see is that as much as it's hopeful for the wise men, we see that they were filled with joy. It is anything but the most wonderful time of the year for the people of Bethlehem. Historians suggests that there was probably around 10 to 30 children that were murdered by Herod based on the population of the time. Can't imagine, I can't imagine the pain and the trauma that the community of Bethlehem were left to face. It was the cost that they would pay for finding room in their town for the savior of the world to be born. And so how does this, like, hateful day bring us any hope today? Three things. And the first thing is actually more of a a warning for us all, I think, which is beware the little King Herod. There's a, a danger, and we've mentioned this before, that when we read the Bible, we can read stories and we can read ourselves into the story as being the hero. Like, oh, I wouldn't have ever done that. And what Herod did was... Well, it was beyond bad. It was just pure evil. And maybe none of us ever would have done that. But for Herod, this was rooted in jealousy and feeling threatened. And I think that there are emotions that we can all feel, right? I know I do. And in all of our hearts this Advent, let's beware the little King Herod in all of us. Let's be reminded of the effects that jealousy and hate can have. This Christmas maybe is going to be a time for some to reconcile with loved ones, with friends and family members where there's been division. Let me just stress for a moment here though, 
please, only if it's safe to do so. I don't want you to hear the wrong thing here. Only if it is safe for you to do so. But maybe there's been years of family feuds and jealousy and rivalry and hate within your heart or others' hearts, and it's time to reconcile this Christmas. Because Christmas can be a time of peace as much as it can be a time of hate. Let's not allow uh, feuds and jealousy and bitterness to take root in our hearts. This story is a reminder to all of us that self-centeredness ultimately only leads to destruction. This is perhaps an extreme example of that, but this Christmas, how can all of us look outside of ourselves and not be self-centered? How do you need to look outwards this Christmas to share the hope and the love that is demonstrated to us by God sending his one and only son? The second thing is this, that chaos is inevitable. Amidst the story of great hope, chaos exists. Christmas is good in so many ways. I love Christmas. There's so much good about Christmas, but chaos exists as well. And Christmas, as we've said, is anything but wonderful for so many. It's actually a time for many of, of dread, a time where they just hope it goes so fast that January couldn't come soon enough. Maybe this Christmas you're all too aware of that chaos in your life, the pain or the grief, the hurt, the confusion, and the trauma that comes with this season. And if that's you, then I'm sorry for what you are facing this Christmas season. Let me just take a moment, though, to speak to the rest of us. Like This season is a time to remember that it isn't the most wonderful time of year for everyone. Let's stay aware of that, all of us. Let's check in on people. Think about what you can do this Christmas to help someone, to be a listening ear, to be a welcoming um, home, maybe even just to be a sensitive host this Christmas. This Christmas, I think the best gift that we could give to our community is to be a community of empathy. That just means to respond to other people's chaos appropriately. To feel what another person is feeling, not just to rush over it, not to be dismissive, and to understand why others might not respond to the hope and the joy of Christmas the way that we would. Our greatest example of empathy, of course, is the reason for Christmas. Jesus arrived as a baby amidst the chaos to be like us to identify with us in our chaos. And of course, his name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. There's a great verse or two verses actually in Hebrews that just want to read Hebrews 4, 15 to 16. This is from the message and it says this. It says, now that we know what we have, Jesus, this great high priest with ready access to God, let's not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a high priest who is out of touch with our reality. Like, let that sink in for a moment. Jesus is fully in touch with our reality this Christmas. If you're in a desperate place, a chaotic place, a painful place, he is in touch with that reality for you. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. Jesus arrived not as a triumphant king, but to many in the world, it looked like weakness. Why? To identify with us and so that we could identify with him. It's a marked contrast to the other rule in the other reign that we've been looking at today in Herod. Herod what we see would stop at nothing, including the murder of innocent children, to realize his self-serving goals. Jesus' earthly reign began with humility. He lived a gentle and love-centered life. His, his death demonstrated that. What we see is Herod takes the lives of others for his own sake. 
that Jesus gives his life for the sake of others? How can we reflect that in our community this Christmas? A few different things that we're doing as a church for our community. Very soon we're going to be launching as a warm space this Christmas or this winter as a warm space in order to um, just open up the building to those that need a warm room, some electric on because of the different struggles that they might be facing this Christmas. We're going to continue to feed families through Make Lunch and our kitchen cupboard project this Christmas. Next Sunday, great opportunity for Lynn and the choir to go into Tesco and to just be hope this Christmas, to represent some joy this Christmas. The following week, we've got our community carol concert. Again, another great opportunity just to be hope in our community. A great thing that I think has happened over the last few years is when we've done our tributes video, and Lois is going to share about that, but again, just pausing to reflect a moment just to remember that for many, Christmas is a painful reminder of grief and loss. We've got our Stuff the Sleigh, which again, Lois will tell us about in a moment, but it's just an opportunity just to be hope in and amidst the chaos of Christmas. So many other things that go on amongst the church and through Lighthouse and PRC this Christmas. But as much as chaos is inevitable, here's the great truth of Christmas, that hope is eternal. As much as chaos is inevitable, hope is eternal. As much as Jesus' first coming maybe to the world looks like weakness, we're told throughout scripture that his second coming will be a triumphant one. Chaos in the world that we know today is inevitable. We've all experienced the truth of this. But the Bible is clear that with Jesus' second coming, chaos will end and hope will be eternal. There's a verse right at the end of the Bible in Revelation 21 verse 4, which just kind of underlines this for all of us. And this is talking about Jesus coming back. It says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. If you're in a place today of chaos and you're dreading this Christmas season, and I'm conscious that a couple of weeks ago I stood up on this stage and said, hey everyone, who's excited for Christmas? And some of you were like, yes. But I appreciate that for some of you the answer is no, not really. Can't wait for it to be over for so many reasons. And this Christmas, we want this to be a safe community for you. We want this to be a place where you can express those emotions. But the onus then is on us as a church to be that safe community. For us to be aware of that chaos that is so evident for many this Christmas, whatever that looks like. And if you are facing a traumatic Christmas, we want you to know that this is a safe place for you, a safe community. The message of Christmas is this, that you can have a relationship with Jesus who amidst the chaos of life loves you deeply. He cares for you abundantly and he identifies with you in your struggles, in your pain in your suffering, in your anxiety, in your trauma. And he wants to draw so near to you. And as that verse in Hebrews reminds us today, walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy and accept the help this Christmas. Church, will you stand and um, just for a moment, we're not going to kind of make it so that if you're in a place of chaos right now, you don't have to kind of respond in any way. But I'd just love to pray for you. And whether that's in the room or online, 
If you are facing a chaotic Christmas, a difficult Christmas for whatever reason today, let me just pray for you right now. Father God, thank you for the reminder of the Christmas story that as you came to bring hope, it was in a chaotic world. And that God, in and amongst the darkness, in and amongst the, the pain, the suffering, the hurt, your light shines. That your hope comes in order to shine light into the darkness. And I pray that today for anyone that's just facing a difficult season right now, that God, that they would know and feel your presence so close, so near. That God, they would know right now your love and your mercy, your peace this Christmas, your comfort, your hope this Christmas. And that God, whatever the pain, whatever the, the chaos may be, God, we just give it to you today. And we ask for your help in each and every situation and circumstance. <coughs> and I just pray, God, that right now, by your spirit, you would come and you would bring hope. Hope that is eternal. Hope that will outlast the chaos and the suffering. Jesus, we just recognize today that for many it's difficult right now. And we just ask for your hope and your comfort to come right now by your spirit. Like only you can do. Bring healing where it's needed. Bring breakthrough where it's needed. And for all of us today, let this Christmas not be a self-centered time, but let it be a time of looking out for others. Let it be a time of helping our community. Let it be a time of restoring relationships within families and marriages, God, and wherever those breakdowns may have been. Let it be a time, God, of just remembering that you came as the greatest gift of all time. In the most humble and unselfish way possible. And let us represent that love to the world around us. In Jesus' name. Amen.